Well, we just thank the Lord for this evening. And let me let me make a, something really clear here. If some of you listened to my sermon last week, it seemed like I was really dead, uh, absolute against any kind of change whatsoever in our environment, up or down or whatever, when I talked about, or, I, you know, basically didn't believe in global warming type of thing. It, it isn't the fact that there isn't variations that are taking place in cooling and heating off, but our planet has done that for hundreds and hundreds of years, and scientists have, have been able to, the ones that don't have an agenda have been able to say, this is a natural way of our, our planet cooling off and doing stuff. But I also see the after effects of a, of a worldwide flood that took place, let's say the flood took place 6,000 years ago, five to 6,000 years ago. With the catastrophic events that took place, it's obvious from most from most people who really are honest and geologists who really study, is that our planet is is getting back to the point of 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 getting to a normal a normal kind of flow, an ecosystem because it was, it's the aftershocks of all the catastrophic events that took place, and so you see a lot of that kind of stuff happening. Um, but we also know too that this world is groaning. It says that it says that this world, the the, the creation, is groaning for the sons of God to to uh, uh, what's the right word for it? Uh, to be to be to be, manifest, to be manifest to come yeah. forth. Uh, our sin has caused this world to fall apart. It's not our emissions. It's not our driving fuel vehicles. It's not this or that. It's it's the sin that we've committed that is causing all the creation around us to really go through these these things in our lives and it's caused the flood in the first place so what you see is after after effects after the flood of the earth kind of coming back to normalcy um, but in that process obviously you're going to have uh things that will continue on and because of our sin increasing as the days get older uh the scriptures actually in matthew yeshua says that these things are going to be the birth, beginning of birth pains so anyway i just want to let you guys know i just want to clarify that a little bit i don't believe that there is not anything taking place out there, but it definitely isn't the direction that we're getting told and, and fed. Uh, we have to believe the scriptures and what the scriptures teach and say. So anyhow, let's move on with the Didache. So tonight we are studying the Didache. Everybody say Didache. Okay. okay. The, the, the clearest teaching, it's a Greek word, which means teachings. And most likely the Didache was, um, was written, I mean, there's been a lot of uh, a debate on when it was written, but it was definitely a Jewish book written to Gentiles. So you see this concept of this Jewish worldview that comes from the Didache that was written to the Gentiles or the non-Jewish people of that time. And so it's got a couple of names to it. One is called the teaching. Another longer name is called the teachings of, uh, to the Gentiles uh, of the teachings of the Lord to the Gentiles by the 12 apostles, okay? And so there's been, been debate on whether or not it was what time it was written, but most of the church fathers refer to it in one way or another. Many of them talk about it. Um, by the 5th century AD, it was kind of moved out of, so in the 400s to 500s, it was kind of moved out of circulation in the church, uh, the so-called church at that time. And I would think that it has more to do with a couple of things. Number one, because it sounded more Jewish than, so speak, so to speak, Christian. And because it sounded, uh, it was kind of archaic in their mindset. It seems like very simple teachings that the church grew beyond and should grow beyond. And so this is this is really key to me because we're called to teach a very basic understanding of halakha. For those of you that are joining us tonight, halakha is the um, Hebrew word for the word to walk or how one walks or chooses their Jewish, um, uh, how, do, how they look at, at Jewish understanding of the scriptures. So we call that word halakha or how one want, it comes from the Hebrew word to halakh, um, uh, the root word uh, hey, Lamed and Kaf, which means to walk, okay? So how one practices their faith. So when you see the Didache, as we read the Didache, you're going to see in the Didache a very simple understanding that was from the apostles that were written to the Gentiles on how to observe their faith as Gentiles without converting to Judaism. And this is what's great. I think this is really important for Messianic Jews. So this is why I think the Didache is really, really important because the Didache helps establish some understandings that we may not have 
uh, otherwise. And so it kind of disappeared for a long time. And when they discovered it in 1850, 1853 or 1873 or something like that, they found, they rediscovered this. Um, and and they, it's, it's absolutely amazing how it, it parallels the book of Matthew. So the book of Matthew is going to be our, our main source text as we look at Matthew. And you're going to see this is also called the teachings of Yeshua. So these are also, so that's another name for the dedicate teachings of Yeshua to the Gentiles. Um, but it was really, I, I guess what we could say was a greater extension of the, the great commission found in Matthew chapter 28, when it says, uh, you know, from Jerusalem to Samaria, to the ends of the earth, or, you know, uh, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. And it was written most likely in, in Syria. Okay, so it was written most likely in the areas where the Jews had dispersed, and many believe that the authors on this wasn't Paul. So here's what's interesting. It wasn't Paul that was necessarily the author of the Didache. It was the, the Jerusalem Council or somebody within the Jerusalem Council, like James um, or Peter or someone else, who, who said, hey, wait, we see this influx of all these non-Jews that are coming in. Paul is obviously uh, an apostle sent out to the to the non-Jews and to, to preach the gospel of Yeshua to the non-Jews. And you have in this, but they, they decided, hey, there's something here. We have to take what Yeshua taught us here and put it into a practical manual. And so this is kind of, um, for some of you that come from a Catholic background, that word catechism. Have you ever heard of the word catechism? Any of you? What does catechism mean? Anybody know what catechism means? Even though it's a Catholic term used quite a bit, what does catechism mean? Go ahead, Sandra. Uh, I believe it's the teachings. Yeah. The yeah. teachings so, of yeah. saints and yeah. all that good stuff. Yeah. So it basically means the, the teachings of the, of the church, so to speak, or the teachings of the apostles or what we hold to. So what, what they would do is they use the, uh, the Didache as sort of a speak, they call it a, um, uh, the other term that they use for the Didache uh, is, is they call it a, um, uh, let me get the right word for it, because I don't want to, um, uh, let me see, it was called, uh, let me see, um, it's a, definitely a catechism, but the other word that they use for it, which I like the other word, uh, uh, would it be a foundation? Foundation. That's that's a good word for it. There's another word I'm thinking, but basically it's a foundation. It's like basically taking our uh, uh, maturity, uh, growing to maturity class that many of us took to become members of Beth Yeshua with Daniel Jester. So it's kind of that. Okay, George, you have your hand raised. Uh, go ahead. George, you want to unmute? You want to unmute, brother? Yeah, I unmuted. <laughs> uh, I don't know the answer here. One of the things that um, I've always, not always, but recently I've, I've been asking is why would Jesus, after his resurrection, for 40 days, teach the apostles about the kingdom of heaven, and yet, it's not in anywhere in the Bible. So that decay, and which got never put in, into the Bible. So here's text that says it's more blessed to give than to receive. That's not found anywhere else in the Bible, any gospels. So, but you know, that I think I said this before, but uh, he a lot more teaching on the king just that one verse so in any, um i think i think it's the um what I, you want to to him i'm talking right now sorry about that okay um so i'm just curious uh what your thoughts are since there's no documentation relevant for 40 days uh, then it it very well could be that the um, apostles uh, would write this um, uh, what we call catechism or what we call uh, the teachings of Jesus Christ through the yeah. apostles. 
yeah. you know, it could be that this is it. This is the 40 days come and clarified. And, and I think some of the issues that Didache addresses would have changed America had we uh, had a back in 1776. We would have had different laws. You know, most of our laws are biblical, and we would have been um, not facing this, these issues that we're facing today. So that's my take. Breaking up okay, real bad, George. You were cutting in and out quite a bit there, uh, George. So I was only able to catch about every other word. But I, th I think I hear what you're saying. Is this? Because it isn't specifically that term isn't used in the scriptures, but that term is. We're just looking at a Greek term here, but the the, the Hebrew equivalent to that would definitely be um, uh, the halakha, the the understanding of the teachings of the rabbi. Um, the because understanding. they name themselves the way that refers right. to. Right, it refers to it. So anyhow, I'm kind of looking for that term because I'd like us to have that term before we move on. I had it down, um, but. We'll look at it. If, I, if it comes to my mind, I'll bring it up. Now, there's a couple of ways that the Didache was used during that time, and there's some people that looked at it, especially the early church fathers, so to speak, and and definitely uh, the, the disciples. They believed in one-on-one -on -one, uh, discipleship. So because Yeshua says to train up disciples, to make disciples, and to go and make disciples of all nations. Um, this was designed in a way that most Jewish scholars and most Christian scholars, when they've studied the Didache, say it looks like it was meant to be read uh, with, with a younger believer and someone who is well-schooled in understanding Judaism and Jewish ways and Jewish understandings, especially those who walked with Yeshua. So there's this concept that in the Didache that as they taught their disciples and you know that's kind of what we do today too right it's interesting when we you know i love the five tools of discipleship that i've brought up to people over over the years and i and i love those and now you don't need five tools you just pretty much need two you need your cell phone and uh money uh and but even on your cell phone you can use for getting money but uh the five tools of discipleship are uh a, the, the bible a scripture promise a piece of paper, a pencil, and enough money for two cups of coffee. And that's kind of what the Didache kind of looks like. It's like it's designed in a way for somebody who knows the ways of the Messiah to sit down with somebody who's new to the faith, especially a non-Jewish believer coming to the faith and receiving instruction in discipleship. And so that you get this word Didache, which means the teachings, okay? So you get that teachings there. Um, but, you know, we were talking about catechism. I like what, what was the word that you used, Linda? Uh, Sandra used um, teaching. Well, no, but uh, like in a meant of instead of a catechism. What oh, the foundation. Foundation, yeah. And so it's kind of used as a foundational class. So let me pull it up here. And it's 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 broken up into six parts in the six books here. Uh, okay, Thomas, you got your hand raised. Go ahead. When I was confirmed is what we called it in the Episcopal Church. It was a, at the end of catechism, we were considered confirmed. Yeah. Yeah, that's another way of doing it. Yeah, definitely. Um, so there's a confirmation course. Oh, order. Order is the right, right term I'm thinking about. Order. So uh, so particular orders within the congregations that were meeting, they would, they would learn this. So, okay, so let's look at chapter one. And what I'm going to do is read through chapter six, because the chapter one through chapter six is divided up into what we call in the Didache, they call that first part there, the ways. Or the two ways, okay? So this is an important part. Now, when we get here now, re recall some of this to Matthew. Now, before we start reading it, though, I want to show you guys, um, uh, and we're going to show it to you guys. Keep in mind a couple of things. Number one, the Didache doesn't, we have to learn how to take what it is at face value, read it, understand it, and then say, okay, um, you know, this is really interesting. How do we look at it from a first century perspective? Again, some people believe the earliest writing of this could have been in 50 AD, which would have been even before some of the some of the other uh, uh, the New Testament writings. Uh, many people believe it was definitely written towards the end of the first century, just before the second, or even into the second century, but right around there. Okay, but but most people believe because it doesn't seem to highlight 
wordings of Paul that it was written before Paul. I tend to believe it came out of the Jerusalem Council. If we look in Acts chapter 15 and we look at what took place in Acts chapter 15 and you look at all that, I believe that it, it was tended to be written uh, by the Jerusalem apostles. And that's part of the term, of, that's one of the uh, titles of the, of the book is the teachings to the Gentiles from the 12 disciples. Um, okay, so, or 12 apostles. Okay, so keep that in mind that we can't use it as a text to say, okay, how do we apply this to what we do today? You have to put it in first century perspective, first century understanding. You have to read it from a Jewish perspective because it's speaking to non-Jewish people. And there's some things in here that we don't agree to today. And, and this is why the, and I'll, I'll point out why the Catholics don't accept it fully and why um, there's Catholics who don't accept it fully. And then there's Protestants who don't accept it fully because one looks like, there's not enough of the Eucharist language used in it to be Catholic. And on the Protestant side, it sounds like it's too, uh, there's not enough grace involved, right? There's not enough of freedom or something. So you'll see it as we go along and you'll see those discrepancies. But again, let's read it for what it says. Let's read it for what it says. Let's read it from a Jewish perspective and understanding and go from there. Uh, Jarrett, you had your hand raised. Did you have your hand raised? Yeah, there's a. I found a PDF version of it online. If anybody wants to yeah, follow but, along and make it easier to read. Yeah, so. no, I'm just gonna, yeah no, well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull it up and we'll read it. So I'll pull up and so we can all read that. But the PDF What's version the online is book? Book. And I'll ask, okay, so I'm going to tell you guys this. This is a book oh, I man, got man. on the Didache. It's actually just the Didache, and you can get a Kindle version of it for, I think, for free. <laughs> if you have Kindle, you can get it for free. And it's not very long. It only has, it has under 3,000 words. So it's not a very long one. You can find the PDF version that Jarrett talks about. I have a book right here that uh, uh, Toby Janiki or Janiki, who went to Christ of the Nations way after I did. I'm, I'm kind of dating myself here. But Janiki, um, he went to Christ of the Nations. He works for um, First Fruits of Zion. So it's a fairly thick book. He wrote a book on the way here, the way of life. It's called the way of life. And it's, this is all about the Didache. So he actually put out a very scholarly book on the Didache. And I was actually really impressed with his work on here. Um, you know, just having an associate's degree from, from Christ for the nations and working with obviously uh, first fruits of Zion. Now I don't, I don't uh, uh, agree with everything at first First Fruits of Zion puts out, I don't agree with their stance on everything, but I do think that they put out some great material that is definitely something to look at. So let's take a look at, um, let me let me share my screen with you, and I'm going to pull up the Didache um, with you guys, and then we'll go from there, okay? Um, hold control, select multiple, I don't want to do that. Let me just try to share it with you. Okay, let's see. Okay, let's see. You guys can see it now, right? Yes. Adrian's Kindle Cloud, okay, yes, okay. All right, okay, so you guys can see this. Let me pull this up out of the way here. Um, okay, let me, oops, I'm trying to get this out of here. Hold on a second. Um, trying to get us out of there. Oh, yeah, I'm gonna make it small, there we go, okay. All right, the Didache, the teachings of the 12 apostles, the teachings of the Lord uh, through the 12 apostles to the nations. So this is literally written to the nations. Chapter one, and again, we're going to read chapters one through chapters six. Uh, there are two ways, one of life and one of death. And there is a big difference between the two. Now, real quick here, I can't see anybody online unmute. Can everybody see this? Everybody mute, unmute if you can. Can you see yes. this? Yes. Yep. Yes. Okay, great. yes. Excellent. excellent. Okay. Yes. All right. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, good. Okay, so there are two ways, one of life and one of death, and there is a big difference between the two. And then so this, again, chapters one through six are going to be broken down into the ways of life. Here is the way of life. To love God who made you, love your neighbor as you love yourself. Do not do anything to another person that you do not want to happen to you. That sounds pretty basic, pretty straightforward right? 
And what we hear is reminiscent of Yeshua saying, love the, and what we have here is the golden rule in the Shema. The Shema, hero Israel, the Lord of God, the Lord is one, Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad, and then Ve'achavka, Lorecha, Kamocha, love your neighbor as yourself, right? So you have those two things, and that's how it starts off with. Now imagine if you were a Jewish person teaching uh, the ways of life to a non-Jewish person who hasn't had any experience whatsoever in Jewish custom and Jewish standard, what's the first thing that you would teach them? To me, it would be the golden rule and and the and and the Shema. It'd be the two ways of, of understanding the Lord. And even Yeshua says in Matthew that these two sum up the entire Torah. So this kind of gives me gives us a, a great indication here of how how the disciples started off right away that the first thing that they wanted to set set right with the nations as the nations were accepting Yeshua as the Messiah is they needed to understand that the the Shema that God is one that he is he is who he is and that we're called to love our neighbor as ourselves so it says living uh, the way of life here is the teaching about how to do those things listed above speak well of those who speak badly about you Pray for your enemies, fast for those who harass you, because what credit do you deserve if you love those who love you? Don't even unbelievers do that? Love those who hate you, and you will have no enemies. I think that is pretty powerful. Now, what is one thing that's added into this little thing that we don't hear quite often when we pray for our enemies? Anybody know? Who wants? I can't see anybody out there, but who who wants to? Let me, let me see. Uh, I can fasting? Stop. Fasting. Fasting. Very good. Thank you, guys. So uh, go ahead and mute back up again. Fasting is something that is brought up in the Didache, which we don't see in the scriptures, which is interesting to me because fasting is actually hard. <laughs> and I like what it says here. It says, what credit do you deserve if you love those who love you? And Yeshua pretty much says the same thing. So you see this here where Protestant churches are saying, well, this can't really be canonized because they're being instructed to fast for their enemies. And Jesus didn't tell us to fast for our enemies. Jesus just said, he just said, uh, Yeshua just said, pray for them, right? So, so you see this difference that's going on here. And you see this happening. But what you also, what we also see that is a little bit different from here from what we would find in Matthew is that Yeshua says there's going to be a time when you will fast because the bridegroom will be taken from you. So that comes to my mind. It's like, I think they made it a standard to do these things. All right, uh, George, if you can stay online with what we're talking about here, you got your hand raised, go ahead and answer. Uh, unmute yourself and answer. Right. Or, Thanks for reminding me to unmute. <laughs> uh, yeah, and Jesus said also, when um, the disciples couldn't deliver a person from demonic uh, forces, that we were to pray, and those, these come not out except by much fasting and praying. So there's another, you know, thing that Jesus spoke about. Uh, that's all I had to say. Okay, great. Thank you, George. That's really good input. And you know what I like here is, is that it, it instructs us to pray for those who harass you. That puts you into a situation where you have to truly focus on that person. You know what I mean? It's like, here, I'll, I'll move away from this real quick. I'll stop sharing right now so we can go back to, um, to us real quick here. Is This puts us in a situation where we have to take we have to take responsibility for another person's soul or another person's life when when we actually start fasting for that person's salvation. So that that shows me how serious they were in taking on someone's salvation and praying for someone who harasses you. Nowadays, when people harass us, we just ignore them or we give them uh, we harass them back. <laughs> Okay, or we do something, or we just, we curse, or we do something, unfortunately, we do those things. But by doing those things, do we really take the time to pray for those who mistreat us? Do we really take the time to do it? So the, so what we see in the Didache here is this connection, this connection here to add fasting to it, because fasting means you're taking this serious, that you're actually going to pray for that person's soul someone's harassing you i think that's really good instruction i don't know about you guys that's good instruction it's not a commandment so to speak 
Um, but it is a, a discipleship training tool. If I was teaching a young disciple in the Lord and they were saying, man, I get harassed all a lot and I get harassed from these people. Well, have you fasted for them and prayed for them? Well, no, I don't really care for them. You see, you see how you take somebody's mindset from a worldly mindset to a godly mindset. A godly mindset just doesn't pray for your enemies, but a godly mindset is willing to die for his enemies. And so you see there this 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 huge contrast between the world and and the Lord. So I like that. I actually like that. Do you, do some of you guys actually like that that idea? Again, it's a good suggestion. I think it's a really good suggestion that when you start fasting for someone and you actually focus on praying for that particular person, you're going to discover <laughs> that God's going to give you a heart of compassion for that person, or you're going to understand where they're coming from. And then when next time you see them or they continue to harass you, you're going to be able to speak in their lives in ways that only God can, can orchestrate you. Uh, Jacob's hand is raised. Yeah. Now, yeah. Hold on a second, Jacob. Remember, guys, some of you just raise your mm -hmm. hand like that. Sometimes I don't have the screen to where we can see everybody. So I really need you to put up your hand and that'll pop up and I'll be able to see it. Electronic. Hand. Yeah, the electronic hand. Okay, not, not put up your hand, but do the electronic hand where you raise your hand. Okay, go ahead, Jacob. Yeah, and I, I realize that the why they're doing this is because at the end of the day, it's like we're not judging these people. God's going to judge them. And every time they do something bad, they're actually just condemning themselves. And every time they bash God or they make something bad, they're condemning themselves further. And you're like, oh, stop. Just like, stop. Because like, you're going to be like getting hit even harder when you come back. So we're called to pray for them because they're going to like, you know, no matter what we do, we can't stop them from doing bad. And we should pray for them because the more bad they do, the harder the punishment is going to be. Yeah, and that, that kind of, uh, thank you, Jacob, that's really good. Uh, that kind of uh, reminds me of uh, that passage or that that little conversation that Yeshua was having when he says how we treat the, those little ones among us, right? And he basically says, you know, how bad it's going to be for the guy who mistreats them. It's better off to, to get a millstone wrapped around your neck and thrown into the ocean than to mistreat one of these little ones. And And that's true. The more people harass believers... They're, they're walking dangerous ground. They're walking truly dangerous ground because Yeshua is our defender and he's the one who's going to protect us. All right, well, let's move on here. And now you're going to find different translations with the Didache as well. Uh, this one is a Kindle, uh, Kindle one um, that we have by, um, uh, uh, I can't remember his name. I'll, I'll give you his name here in a second. All right, so let me share the screen again. Uh, we were doing pretty good there. Where are we at? The Didache over here. Okay, so... All right, so uh, we come back here, and it says, um, um, oops, <laughs> I don't know how that moved. I want that up there. There you go. Okay, so the way of life. So now let's go to the next page. Um, let's see, page down. Okay, oops, or page. How do I go to the next one? Let's see. Okay. Okay. Sorry, guys, just trying to move it forward. I don't know why it didn't go forward when I went. There we go. Oops, where'd I go now? Okay, love your enemies. Okay, let's see. Okay, abstain from physical and bodily cravings. Is that right? Yeah, restrain. Okay, no, wait, where are we at? Okay. Okay, and then 1.3, I don't know why we missed it here. Um, I don't know why it's missing. I'm sorry, guys. I'm... I'm not getting the whole thing here let me figure out what's going on okay um is that the right one where i was saying is that the very next next one abstain from physical bodily cravings did i say that but there's something else in here oh, too is it, it's this okay it's yeah. on 14 yeah but this is where i want to go though I know, but this is where I want to be. Oh, okay. That would uh, be it's missing a whole verse page. on the previous page, but it's not. Okay. So let's see. Oh, here. Okay. I'm sorry. I did. That was, um, uh, no, we did that. Uh, we already spoke of that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So we did those. Okay. So we are on one four. Okay. Okay. All right, guys. Sorry about that. So the next one, abstain from physical and bodily cravings. Uh, if someone hits you on your right cheek, Offer him your left cheek. Um, let me get this out of the way. And you will be perfect. If someone forces you to go one mile, then go two miles. If someone takes your coat, give him the shirt off your back too. 
If someone takes something that belongs to you, do not ask for it back and do not try to take it back by force. Give to everyone who asks something from you and do not demand it back because the Father wants his gifts to be distributed to everyone. Anyone who can follow this commandment and give like this is blessed and is declared not guilty. I love that. Woe to anyone who receives. And now this is this is interesting. So they're giving us a little warning here. It says, woe to anyone who receives. Anyone who receives while in need is not guilty. But anyone who receives when not in need is like a thief who should be locked up until he confesses, confesses and pays back for what he has stolen. He will not be set free until he has paid the last penny. Nevertheless, it has been said, let your gifts sweat in your hand until you know to whom you are to give it. Wow, that's pretty powerful. So let's stop. Let's stop sharing that right there for a second right now. Um, that those are interesting things. When I read that last part there, what I was reminded of was uh, Ananias and Sapphira, who were found guilty of lying to the Holy Spirit by saying, you know, they were asked the question, is this everything you received from your sale of your home? And they said, yeah, yeah, it is. And they, they had decided to put some stuff off to the side on their own. Now, remember the instruction that uh, Peter gave them said, listen, it's your house. You sold it. You could have kept whatever you want and give the rest of it, but you chose to lie to the Holy Spirit. And so I see this woe on this thing here. It's like, be careful of how you give and how you receive and and i see that instruction kind of caught in it it's like if you really need something like i know people who ask for money who really don't need money but they're asking for money all the time and they really don't need money uh, what they really need is is training in money or disciples discipling in money because they, they're they keep running out of money because they're not doing it they're not using the money they have properly i see that a lot but i also see people who need money who don't have money and so what they're trying to do here is saying, woe to the person. So they're given kind of a warning in this thing. Hey, be careful. When, when, if you receive from people, make sure you really need it. But if you don't need it and you're asking people for that, be careful because you may be found guilty of thievery or you may be found guilty of doing something that isn't kosher. And that's what draws me to this Ananias and Sapphira that we see in the book of Acts. And we got to remember in those days, um, especially in the first century, there wasn't a welfare system. There, it was the body of believers that took care of the other people in, in need. And so that's really the different basis. They didn't have a social security system like we have today. They didn't have banks where they can go down and, and, and get a loan and do those type of things. They had to take care of one another. You had to take care of family members. You had to take care of your parents. You took care of your neighbors if they were in need. So you see all this stuff taking place. And so you get this I see this in here where it says, whoa, uh, you know, uh, just be careful, you know, and I love the first part here where it says restrain yourself from natural and physical inclinations. I love that because what it's talking about here isn't so much don't eat, but it's saying is don't give in to fleshly things. Don't give in to to ungodly things. Um, uh, be careful of those things and, and restrain from those things. Um, what is anybody else picking up from what we read? I'd like to hear from some somebody. Let me go to a view here where I can see the gallery here. Uh, okay, George, your hand is raised again. George? Okay, anybody else? Hello. Yeah, there you are. Okay. You can hear me? Yeah, now we can. Okay. Uh, I have an easy to read Didache. It, it says, um, translation, if anyone takes something that's yours, don't ask for it back. In fact, you're not allowed to. Wow. Give to everyone who asks. You already read that. Um, well, God. I like that. Though. I like that. No, let, me, let me check real quick here. I like that because people will come to me and ask for money all the time or uh, or relatives or somebody will say, hey, can you loan me a few bucks? Can you loan me a hundred bucks or whatever like that? I, I never loan. That's just a policy I have. I think that loaning money to family and friends is destructive and divisive, and it can put a wedge between really close friends and family. So I actually, my life, I've, at least for the last 15 years of my life, I've practiced just giving and, and not expecting anything in return. 
And uh, and I've done that. And I think Linda's had that same attitude. It's like you're gonna bless somebody, just bless them. And and but I like what your your translation says. It says, matter of fact, you're not re you're not uh, you're not supposed to ask for the money back. So go ahead, George. Yeah, uh, you can still. Hear. Okay, uh, it says, "Give to everyone who asks you, and don't ask for anything in return." God wants us to give from the gifts He has given to us. Wow! And then you are blessed if you follow this commandment because you are blameless. Wow. So anyway, that's um, th what I like about the Didache is it's getting into specifics, very detailed, and uh, it expounds tremendously on Jesus teachings, uh, Jesus teachings in the Gospels. And it, uh, you know, it just builds the Didache builds on it. And, and it's just changing my life completely. After I read about it until you I didn't even know about it until you said a few weeks ago that you were going to teach on it. And I've been researching like crazy to, to find more about it, find out more about it. So, okay, go ahead. Well, no, that's really good to hear. And I, I would say that, um, go ahead and uh, mute yourself again there so we don't hear anything in the background. Um, but I would say, I would say what's really cool about this, again, the Didache was designed to be a practical manual on how to live in Yeshua so that you brought that right up George it's excellent you said it's kind of like it's it's getting very practical it's getting into the nitty and gritty of being practical so instead of just being a book on on good living or something like that it gives us actual practical things that we can do for instance fasting for your enemies right of, or for those who harass you fasting for them that takes it to another level. It's it's pretty interesting. Jarrett, your hand is raised. Yeah, I love this for this, you know, this training manual here to take a young, a new believer or even a seasoned believer from resentment and fear to love and compassion. That whole section yeah. we're reading. Speak it, say it again, Jared, because you were kind of breaking in and out. But can you go oh. ahead and, and say that again without stopping? Because when you stop, your speaker takes over and then stops and takes over. So can you try to say it without without uh, uh, okay. pausing? I appreciate this section because it's a very simple way to help a new believer go from resentment and fear to love and compassion. Amen. Excellent. That's and the right, thing I, right. I think about lately was, you know, I've been asking Yeshua if we could, you know, have a love for the lost like he has. So that's just what it reminds me of. Yeah, that's really good. And, and like we were talking about, when you actually take a practical step to fast for those who harass you, you get a compassionate heart for them, right? And uh, because you can't, how do you really fast for someone that you really don't care about without God's heart, right? You're not going to, right? You need God's heart to kind of do it. Yeah. Uh, Thomas, go ahead, Thomas. Can't hear you, Thomas. Hey, Thomas, we can't, we can't hear you. You might have to get a little closer, brother. Yeah, that's very possible. Uh, I'm on my, my wife's show, so. It's really difficult. Go ahead and try again, see if you can get it. Yeah, I don't think it's going to work very well because my speaker doesn't, my microphone doesn't seem to work. And I know why. Okay. Well, I can hear you over there pretty good. <laughs> I can I can hear you digging into there, but when you're by the computer talking, okay, I can't hear you. Okay, let's try this now. Can you hear me now? Oh, oh yeah, that's okay. great. <laughs> yeah, I had my Bluetooth speaker on, and it was trying, so it was trying to grab microphone off of it. Um, what I see from the from the first part of the Didache is a very in depth version of the Sermon on the Mount. 
Exactly. And it brings him super, it brings us even more detail to what Yeshua was actually suggesting, or not suggesting, but teaching us in instructions on the Sermon on the Mount, including the fact, you know, the, that if somebody hits you on the right cheek, you know, turn your other cheek to him. It is almost word for word in some ways, the generalization, and then they get deeper into it. And they, they, they tell us what we should be doing and give us specifics to it. So I really like the Didache because that part of it for me gave me a better understanding of what Yeshua was telling me in, in the Sermon on the Mount. Yeah, and if you, if you take a look at what Yeshua says in Matthew 28 and says, everything I have instructed you teach and make disciples, right? Uh, and to take these things on. This is why it doesn't have Pauline theology behind it or Pauline verbiage. Uh, it doesn't sound like Paul's teaching this. It sounds like the, there's been people who actually took the Sermon on the Mount, the teachings of Yeshua, and took those teachings of Yeshua and now are instructing the, the non-Jewish people who are becoming part of the commonwealth of Israel with the believing Jews. And he's coming in and he's saying, listen, these are some, these are the teachings of the master, of, of the rabbi. Uh, just like today in Orthodox Judaism or in Lubavitch Judaism, they're going to tell you what Menachem Schneerson says. They're going to tell you all this stuff of what the Rebbe says and all this stuff like that. And, and they go they go almost to an extreme of it. That's exactly what the disciples are doing here to a, a better degree and to a life-giving degree, if that makes sense. All right. So very good, guys. Good uh, good input on there. Uh, let's continue on, okay? I like all the fact that you guys like the Didache. I know that it's it's something that causes people to like really like, well, I don't know about this, you know, type of thing. But I, I think it's great to look at it. And again, we're not looking at it as canonized in the sense that it is scripture. But we are looking at, at it being an order of how to walk in God during the first century because this was passed on to many non-Jewish people. OK, so let's take a look at it again. OK, so I love this last part here, too, as we're looking at it here. It says, nevertheless, it has been said, let your gifts sweat in your hand until you know to whom you are to give it. I love that. I don't know about you guys, but I really, really like that. I think that is a really good instruction right there to get us to um, to get us to see that. Um, let's continue on here first, George. Before I know that you've raised your hand again, but let's move on here for a second. OK, so. Um, let me get to the next one. Okay. Uh, let's go. Oh, why didn't it change? I don't know why it did. Okay. Let me come here. Oops. Okay. And then let me come down. Okay. Here's the second commandment of the teaching. So this is chapter two. So now we go into chapter two. Is that how it is here? It Same is. thing. Okay. So chapter two says, uh, do not murder. Pretty straightforward. Exactly right. Do not commit adultery. Do not have sex with children. Do not be sexually promiscuous. Do not steal. Do not practice magic. Do not use drugs. Do not abort a child or kill babies. Do not yearn to possess things that belong to your neighbor. Do not commit perjury. Do not give false testimony. Do not speak evil. Do not hold a grudge. Do not be two-faced because this is a deadly snare. And among the Jewish people, let me say this. Uh, Two-faced was a huge thing, a lashon hara, and we all have talked about this in the past. Being two-faced and being uh, this, you know, a liar is really a huge thing in the Jewish community in the first century because this is a deadly snare. Do not let your words be meaningless, but back them up by what you do. Do not be greedy. Do not be materialistic. Do not be hip a hypocrite. Do not be malicious. Do not be arrogant. Do not hatch evil plots against your neighbor. Do not hate anyone. You are to correct some, pray for others, and some you are to love even more than your own life. Pretty powerful stuff. Okay, so let's go on to the, let's Wait, continue. Oh, you want to stop? Comment, when it talks about the details, it says, do not murder children through abortion or kill them after they've been born. Um, granted, I'm sure that, yeah, children were aborted throughout history but yeah. to have it written here clearly is it's pretty powerful yeah very pretty powerful. powerful i wish it were still part of scripture <laughs> yeah that was pretty powerful in those days they probably gave them uh something to drink some kind of poison to drink that would cause a, a woman to uh you know to to to, to lose her baby 
Um, they still have those kind of things, the pills and stuff that people can take. Um, and, and this translation may some, say something different from others' translations. But so far, pretty powerful stuff in chapter two here that we're getting. And it's straightforward. There's nothing in here that I don't see that is not biblical. Um, I think that this holds to a biblical center. Now, George, you had, you had your hand raised. Did you want to add from the previous chapter? And now, uh, before we go forward, uh, let me go back to George. Or let me go back to the gallery here. Okay, George, go ahead. Okay, so, yeah, just that last verse of the first chapter again, where it says, let your hands sweat, okay, which basically is saying, uh, be careful, you know, that's, you know, I'm trying to paraphrase it. But um, there, then later in the Didache, uh, they give instructions to give the tithe to the prophet and if there's no prophet you give it to the poor and so right. yeah. you're jumping ahead but yeah, yeah we'll I'm, jumping ahead, but, uh, I'm just telling you that's um that's what it ends up um you know uh what when it's talking about giving it's talking about make sure you're giving it to what where god wants it to go you know exactly. and so at any rate, and then like um, she just said um, about abortion, had America, uh, you know, we were founded on the Bible. Um, there's scripture principles all throughout the Constitution and the Declaration and all that. And so had we passed laws that the Didache is is telling us about, we wouldn't have the abortion issue today. It would have been already settled when we started this country, you know? So I just wanted to throw that out too. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Um, when I hear about the sweat in the hand too, I actually think about don't let your right hand know what your left hand is doing as well, is to be very careful on how you give to people you know, don't don't uh, proclaim it throughout the nations. Wow, well, I gave so and so two hundred and fifty thousand dollars, <laughs> or I guess you know it's like you know we don't boast about those things. Don't let your right hand know what your left hand is doing. Really be cautious with how you give money. You know, the scriptures G Yeshua actually says, you know, give to everyone who asks if it is in your ability to do so. And uh, it's like so I've made that part of my practice as well. If people ask, and we do have it, and we can do it. We can do it, but there's times where we do it a little too much, and then we're hurting for food. <laughs> Has anybody ever had that issue? But you know, and that, well, it kind of doesn't. Let me say this: we're not hurting for food. We've never hurt for food. But what I mean by that is, like, at the end of the month, our our income is like very, very low. But God's always provided, and uh, but sometimes we 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 give more than uh, than we should. <laughs> You know, we're not required to give all of our finances. Believe it or not, people, you're, you know, God, God allows our finances to come into your life so you can live a little bit too. So you can, you can actually pay the bills. All right. Okay. Let's move on. Um, I like chapter two so far. It's really straightforward. And think about this again, before I share the screen here, let me just say this before I share the screen again. Again, these are Jewish people that are instructing a Gentile world that's coming out of of paganism that's coming out of things where to to commit adultery to commit murder uh you can murder your slaves in rome and not even get in trouble for it okay you could you can abort freely there was that free society and doing those kind of things uh the the um the uh, uh you guys ever watch um they were known for uh 300 who are the the spartans the spartans were known for throwing children that had defects and stuff over cliffs or anybody that was born with any kind of um de uh, deficiency of of anything like that they were they were destroyed because they only wanted the strongest of the strongest of the strongest and then they were raised to be warriors and stuff like that so these things were in practice around throughout all the nations around israel and israel actually had a uh, a, a godly presence at which in and of itself drew the Gentiles because he had righteous Gentiles, right? He had righteous uh, non-believers that were drawn to the faith of the Jewish people uh, during in that time period. So this just kind of reiterates again that, hey, listen, if you're coming into this 
Commonwealth of Israel as a non-Jew and you're participating in the in the God of Israel. These are things that we require and they give us practical things. Practical things is you don't murder. You don't, uh, what does it say on ours here? Do not murder children through abortion. Is this one following the one that we're doing pretty, pretty close, well? Yeah. Okay, because I got the book. And again, guys, you'd have to go to First Fruits of Zion uh, to get the book, okay? But it's called The Way of Life. And it's worth it. I think it costs thirty dollars or whatever it was it was kind of spendy but i would encourage you to get it it's pretty thick you read through it um you, you do it but you can order just the didache itself like jared jared found a free pdf i think um and there you know i think it's free on kindle or just even if anything it's three dollars and stuff you can read it and then study it but um anyhow let's continue on from where we were at okay so do not hate anyone you are to correct some pray for others and some you are to love even more than your own life, okay? So let's go to the next one. My child, so we get into chapter three here, flee from you. Now this, again, practical stuff going on here. My child, flee from every kind of evil and from everything that looks evil. Do not get angry because anger leads to murder, which is true, okay? It truly is. You, I mean, I love listening to HLN. I am a HLN junkie. I'm sorry for this, guys. You probably won't like me after this, but I love listening to uh, uh, forensic files and discovering how, you know, somebody committed murder here or where, or, you know, because I love human, I love investigation. I love investigating human nature. Um, but in the process of investigating human nature, what we find often is somebody will be very upset the wife will be very upset at the husband or the husband will be very upset at the wife and instead of just getting a divorce just get a divorce and move on with your life just you know, get a divorce give half and and just go your own way and and pray that god would reconcile if god can reconcile but people get drawn to anger so heavily that it causes them to lead to murdering their, their spouse, the, the one that they're supposed to love more and above and beyond everybody else. It, it just, it absolutely, it blows me out of the water. So we see here where it says, do not get angry because anger leads to murder. Do not be jealous, argumentative, or hot-tempered because all these things breed murderers. Wow. And envious in the HLM, there's a lot of times when they're trying to get inheritances and insurances and life insurance life insurances and everything yeah. they're envious for that exactly it's so true okay now it goes on to the next one my child do not be lustful because that leads to being sexually promiscuous which is true right do not be foul mouthed and do not let your eyes wander because it breeds adultery even in the mind even in our thoughts my child do not be a fortune teller because that leads to idolatry pretty powerful right there do not cast spells do not be an astrologer do not make magic charms or amulets uh, to ward off illnesses do not even want to look at any of these things because they all breed idolatry my child do not be a liar because lying leads to stealing do not be greedy or conceited because all these things lead to stealing my child do not complain because it leads to blasphemy do not be self-important or evil-minded because all these things lead to blasphemies. And then it goes on to being meek. Be meek because the meek will inherit the earth. Again, we're going back to the Beatitudes here, the teaching on the Sermon of the Mount. Be slow to get angry. Be merciful. Be innocent. Be slow to speak. Be kind. Revere the words you have heard. Okay, so let's stop there for a minute and share now at that point. So pretty powerful things here. Um, um pretty powerful things anybody want to speak into that what we just read there and you guys heard what me and linda said which is pretty powerful um uh but anybody else want to speak in it jared i just can't help but notice that clearly the things that these new believers were being told to do was against the norm of the world at that time. Like these things were the norm of the world. Like what like you read about totally with children and the abortion and all those things, just the norm. And the same, same thing today. Same thing. Yeah, and it, I, it, I think even the wickedness here is getting worse as the norm of our world as we continue moving toward the day. Yeah, I would agree with you on that. I think. I think the other thing too is that we see too is there is is the right word uh, direct uh, uh, 
uh, expose or ex uh, what's the word? Uh, uh, juxtapose or ju juxtapose. juxtapose or what? The direct opposite of the world is godliness in many ways. And it's really sad. Now in the world, we see, we see compassion, we see mercy, we see all those things. And we do see that. So we're not one, we're, I'm not trying to say that everybody in the world is lost in the sense of doing what is right, because there are people who do righteous things in the world, but there is a direct opposition of what is found in the scripture as being what is holy and what is not being holy in the world to come. And even though our salvation isn't based by what we do and don't do, we have a requirement and we have a responsibility as a believer to step into halakha. Again, for those of you that are visiting for the first time tonight, halakha is to walk. There's a proper way to walk in the Lord, and he gives us the instructions to do it. Now, this is one of the reasons why the Protestants didn't make this canonized in the scriptures, or not even so much the Protestants, but but um, uh, even the Catholics, they struggle with this a little bit. And part of the reason why is because it seemed to go beyond uh, allowing you to be led of the Holy Spirit. But these things are being led of the Holy Spirit. And if you love God, you're going to be obedient to God and you're going to stay away from those things. So, you know, we stay away from all these things if we love God. It's just called, it's part of our nature as believers to walk a righteous life before the Lord. George, you have your hands raised again? George, go ahead. And then Junior, we'll have you right afterwards. I see like uh, aspects of the Proverbs and a lot of wisdom in here. I see uh, Job in here, all kinds of, um, uh, just a second. Um, there's so much uh, wisdom and um, uh, it reminds me of the Proverbs and, yeah. and, um, you know, where, where, and, and how Job, he accepted his lot, so to speak, where, uh, you know, God tested him to the point of near death. And, and then, you know, this is telling us accept whatever God's, you know, uh, allowed to happen in your life. So there's, there's just a ton of, um, um, I don't know, just an inspiration for me to look at this. It, it's just, um, uh, well thought out and well put together and it ministers to me and, and notice what what you said and what jared said too is there's a it, it looks like there's such a, an opposing view from what was going on around them and god was calling them out of that and that really is what the term hebrew is is to be to cross over to come out and so when you when you when you understand the concept here that when you get born again and you get saved and set free of sin, we're called to come out of that world into the kingdom of God. And so this is all about kingdom practice. This is all about walking right before the Lord. I don't see there's, I don't see anything in here so far contradictory to what the scriptures instruct us to do. Uh, Junior, you had your hand raised. Yeah, I was actually thinking the same thing George said. It has the book of Proverbs written all over it. And I was looking at Proverbs chapter one, verse 15. And that's what it said. My son, do not walk in the way with them. Keep your foot from their path, for their feet run to evil, and they make haste to shed blood. I mean, it's it's pretty much to keep us safe. You know, it's not to harm us. So, yeah. Amen. Great, great. Linda. Yeah, I thought it was interesting how they add detail to what Scripture has when it says, "My child, don't be a complainer, because this leads to blasphemy." Nor that kind of that kind of gives you like a little insight, a deeper insight. Something. Right. Nor egocentric, nor malevolent. For all these things, blasphemy results. And I think it's uh, when you're complaining, I have a better idea than what God is giving me. <laughs> you complain a lot. No, no, I complain. <laughs> <laughs> and when when you're egocentric, that's self-explanatory. Oh, that's not and me at all. <laughs> malevolent is against yeah. somebody else right so you're in the place of god so i never looked at it that way yeah it's true uh pretty powerful stuff right and and believe it or not i mean the children of israel 
the first generation that went into the desert never got to see the promised land, mostly because they complained. And they were they were kvetchy. <laughs> you know, Amy knows uh, Yiddish, so Amy can help us out with all the Yiddish words. But they were they were kvetching because they were uh, they were uh, water, no food, no food, no water. At least in Egypt, there's <laughs> leeks and onions, and there's all this wonderful stuff. We had, you know, it's like they'd rather go back and be a slave and die in bon bon uh, uh, you know um, a ban bondage instead of being set free and, and trusting God to provide for them. Where's my quail? Yes. Where's my quail? I'll give you quail. <laughs> you want quail? You're going to get sick of it. <laughs> That's kind of what he did. He, he got them, they got sick of it because he gave them so much. All right. So let's, uh, let's move on here. Um, all right. We got a couple of others that joined us. Welcome guys. All right. So let's go to share the screen again. Um, all right. So let me do that. Okay. So being meek, be meek because the meek will inherit the earth. I'll just read that over again. Be slow to anger, be merciful, be innocent, be slow to speak, be kind. Again, we see Proverbs all over it. Revere the words you have heard, okay? And then we have, uh, oops, chapter, oops, I went backwards, huh? Oh, let me go back, sorry. Okay. Okay, and, and do not exalt yourself, am I right? Okay, mm -hmm. do not exalt yourself. Don't let your soul become overconfident. I love that. Uh, do not let your soul embrace the lofty, but walk with the just and the lowly. Accept whatever happens to you as good, knowing that nothing happens apart from God. That's pretty powerful right there. That steps us into a realm that um, a lot of people struggle with. Um, how can this evil thing happen to me be from God? How can God allow, uh, how can he allow all this hate and all this murder and all this stuff. If God really sits on the throne, why doesn't he stop wars and, and, and abortions and all this kind of stuff? And, uh, and you know, the, it's a philosophical question, definitely at, at minimum, but it is a theological understanding too, is that do we really trust God? And if the Bible says that the love of most will grow cold in the end days, we have to really understand it from that perspective. Why is the love of most growing cold? It's because they don't see God sitting on his throne over some of these negative things that are taking place. And we have to understand that if God is the God of, of righteousness, he's also the God that can orchestrate righteousness out of evil that takes place in our lives. Uh, we are people who definitely have free will. And I remember one person talking to me one time and saying, well, if God is so great, why does he allow this? And I looked at the person while they were still talking. I said, why do we allow it? And then he got, he stopped right there. He's like, what? He goes, yeah, why do, why do you allow it? Well, I can't do nothing about it. So you expect God to do something about it? You know, it's like, you know, the thing is, is that God could do something about it, but then he steps into the realm of taking away free choice from us. And therefore, we have no responsibility for what we do. So it's easy to just blame the devil. Why not blame the devil for all this? Why are you guys always blaming God for this? But we can't even blame the devil for it either because we're called to have personal responsibility. And so when this person said, well, if God is so great, da, 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 why does he allow this? It's a, and I told this person, why do you allow it? Well, there's nothing I can do. Of course, there's something you can do. You can raise your kids to not go that route. You can raise your family. You you have, we all have a circle of influence around us. They call that a sphere of influence around us. Every single one of us have a sphere of influence. And if the more righteousness that we influence the people around us, the more that influence continues on and spreads to other people. Okay. I think this new movie that came out, The Sound of Freedom with Jim Caviezel, is bringing out the awareness of child trafficking, which is the third largest uh, uh, box office. Well, no, not the box office. No, third largest. Um, it's bigger than the, the drug. It's like right behind the drug trade or it's above the drug trade. It's like it's like the third largest uh, crime in the world. He's bringing He's bringing this to light, and boy, there are people who are hating this. There are theaters that are not turning on the AC in there. There are theaters who all of a sudden the movie stops working. There are, there are, there are critics who are protesting the movie. Why? Is because the, the light is exposing this evilness that is out there. And to think that in America, America 
carries or holds some of the most trafficked people in the entire world. We're like number one in this area. All this stuff that's going on around us, it's like, why are we putting up with it? It's very difficult for us to, to make a difference uh, culturally, but we can make a difference locally. And that's where it starts. As we make a difference locally, the more Jacob continues to walk with the Lord in his walk with God and honors Yeshua, that will influence his mom and dad, right? Um, the more that Jared does that, the more that will influence his family. The more that Thomas does it will influence his, his boss and other people around him and everybody else, every one of us, junior, and, and every single person I'm looking at. The more that we choose to walk in God's righteousness and choose to do his will, we influence the people around us, and that's what we can do. Now, some of us have a stage uh, that we can speak at or a, a pulpit to speak from, so to speak, like I do. Other people have bigger bigger ways than that. Some people are huge influencers online or whatever. Um, but we all have a microphone to some degree. So we can change the world around us. You know, my, my kids always say, Dad, we don't want to have children and bring them into this world because this world's just horrible. I, and I say, I understand that. But it's how you raise your children it's how you develop righteousness in your children it's how you bring forth god's ways into those children that make a difference not the world okay so that's really important junior your hand uh yeah one one verse that i've always loved is when the lord is talking to cain and he tells him if you do well will you not be accepted and it says if you do not do well sin lies at your door and his desire is for you but you should rule over it so he gives you that life or death option you know what i mean it's for you to make that decision and that basically decides the outcome of how everything plays out yeah yeah and you know yeah and you think about it it's like god god sits on his throne unashamed unafraid and not uh caught off surprise by anything we do <laughs> but allows us to still make up the decision to do what we want to do <laughs> how wild is that all right let's move on here because it's it's a quarter after um i want to keep going so let me share again okay so accept whatever happens to you as good um uh from the lord okay and then let's move on okay so chapter four remember those who preach now this is where we kind of get into some things so this is kind of interesting my child never forget those who continually preach the word of god to you that's actually biblical. We see that instructed in the Berith Hadashah in the New Covenant, where it says, pray for those who especially are, who, who work among you and labor among you and treat them well. Don't, you know, uh, give them uh, finances. You'll see this throughout the scriptures. Okay, treat these preachers. And this kind of translation isn't really a modern translation. In my, I mean, it's too modern in my perspective. What does this say here? Treat, uh, or uh, who speaks. Okay. Uh, Treat these preachers as if they were the Lord himself because the Lord is present in the word they preach. Now, that is very consistent with John, the book of John. And uh, in the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. And out of the word, uh, God spoke the word and creation came through it. The word is how God manifests his presence and his nature and his character to, to us around us. So when you hear this, that they preach the word. I love that. That's a huge responsibility, though. <laughs> and this is why he says some should not presume to be preachers, but, you know, for they'll be judged harshly or more judged. Uh, seek out the saints every day and find support in their company and in their words. I love that. Now, see, if you were being a disciple, if you were being a if you were discipling somebody young in the faith and you were you were training them in all righteousness and you're working with that person you would instruct them to keep to do that you would say don't forsake the assemblies of saints that's a fancy way of us saying that today don't forget don't forsake the assembling of the saints but in this what we're reading here in the didache is they gave instructions to say listen seek out the the fellowship, seek out the company, seek out the words of those who are believers among you, because it'll bring you encouragement. Isn't it true that when we get around believers, we get encouraged? You know, um, I'm the kind of guy that I was raised in Wyoming. I love hunting. I love fishing. I love camping. I'm one of those guys that can go off into the mountains and probably be gone for two years and be fine. I really am one of those guys, but I know that I would be, I would be, um, I would be pretty, pretty lost. Uh, 
in here because I do love the connection with people. I do love uh, the camaraderie. I do love uh, the debates. Junior saw a little bit about that this week. <laughs> But I like a little bit of the debate. I like the 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 camaraderie, the iron sharpening iron. I love I love uh, the fellowship of 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 the of the ring. <laughs> I love I love that stuff where we get together and and rub elbows and talk. So I could probably survive out in the mountains and the woods, and I wouldn't get too lonely. But I I know that I wouldn't be who God's called me to be in that situation. God hasn't called me to go out into the mountains. He's called me to be around people and to help influence them for him. And so that's kind of what I'm called to do. So I choose this lifestyle as opposed to that lifestyle, even though my nature part of me wants to go that route. So uh, let, let's read on. Um, uh, we're on the do not crave. Okay, I have four, we're on 4.3. Let me get to it again. Um, okay, do not cause divisions. Um, make peace between those who quarrel judge righteously i love this make peace between those who quarrel that is a very jewish concept here okay this is a very this is called the bait din this is called establishing uh, righteousness you have the the house of judgment that you come forward together it says judge righteously i love this because this is in line with the scriptures a lot of christians say that we're not called to judge no, we're, the scriptures tell us to judge those who are on the inside, not those on the outside. And when it's saying that, it's saying to make righteous judgments, but not to condemn someone. So we don't want to condemn someone to hell because that's not our job. We don't judge people to hell. We don't condemn people to hell. That's not our job. What we're called to do is make righteous judgments. And within the body of Messiah, there's this thing called the Beit Din, the house of judgment. And in that house of judgment, we're called to bring situations like quarrels and other stuff to, to help people go through those processes and really understand God's ways in that. And I love what it says here. Do not cause divisions. Make peace between those who quarrel. And, and, and we see, again, Matthew written all over this. Uh, Blessed are the peacemakers, right? And it says, judge righteously. Do not show partiality when correcting people. I love that for what they are doing, for what they are doing wrong. And that's true. One thing as a rabbi that I try to make it a, a it's not a commandment by any stretch of the imagination, but people try to do it, is they'll say, well, a, a pastor and a rabbi shouldn't know what people give. Well, I don't try to know what people give. However, sometimes I'm, I'm privy to it. I'm not, um, I can't escape it because sometimes somebody will give me a tithe check that they forgot to put in the box, or sometimes somebody will say, hey, can you make sure this gets put in, or they'll do that, and so, and then sometimes, you know, I, I see what some people give at times, but I got to tell you guys, I, I am not focused by that at all. I am focused by treating everybody as impartial, uh, you know, partially, or I don't show partiality. I'm trying to be impartial is what I'm trying to say, is that I, I don't care if somebody gives a dollar to the congregation or they give a million dollars to the congregation i'm going to treat them just like i treat everybody else and i hope that's what you guys have received from me in that and because i don't really care what people give to tell you the truth <laughs> oh wait this is being recorded don't don't let don't don't tell anybody else okay <laughs> okay but, uh, anyhow for what they are doing wrong do do not waver or become indecisive because you are trying to live both in the world and in the church I love that. Okay, so they use the word church here. However, I would understand that if this had been written in Hebrew, and I think it was written in Hebrew, because when you read the way it reads, it's very simple. It's a very simple Greek, and I think it was written in Hebrew initially, and I think it was translated to Greek. And so we would have saw here, live both in the don't don't try to live both in the world and in the kahal or in the you know in the you can't live in both, and that's very 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 much biblical. Okay, now giving and money. So this is interesting. Do not be eager to receive, but unwilling to give. So basically give, be willing to give. If you worked hard and made money, give some of the money away as a ransom for your sins. Now that's interesting. So this is where the Catholics uh, really started incorporating, uh, what is that? Uh, the practices of uh, that Martin Luther nailed the, the, the thing to the cross is, um, uh, somebody say it to me, somebody's on, uh, Indulgences. indulgences okay do not hesitate to give do not grumble about giving because the one who is good to you who 
will your wages uh, to the one who is good to you who will your wages and give you your reward never complains about giving to you do not turn away from someone in need but instead share everything you have not claiming anything as your own because if you can share what uh, if you can share what will perish how much more will you share what is imperishable do not neglect your responsibilities to your children. Begin teaching your children when they are very young to reverently fear God. Okay, let's stop doing that there. The only one that I have here that I have questions with and we'll talk about here is where it says, if you worked hard and made money, give some of the money away as a ransom for your sins. Let's talk about that a little bit. What does somebody think they mean when we read that there? Anybody want to tackle that? Uh, oh, Linda's going to do it. Go for it, Linda. Well, there's a time when they were too far away from Jerusalem to carry the ox or the sheep to Jerusalem. They exchanged it for money and then went to Jerusalem to give the money instead of uh, an animal. That's good but, insight. It's good insight. Okay, that's really good. Anybody else want to speak to that? That's really good, Linda. Uh, Jarrett, he's not raising his yellow hand. He's supposed to be raising oh. his digital hand there. That's right. We forgive him. Oh, he got it. He got it. Go ahead, bro. Nonconformist. I um, was thinking about that psalm that says, you know, who can redeem his brother? No one can redeem his brother. So one should stop trying forever. Yeah. Very, very good. Yeah. So so we see a discrepancy in here. And so uh, when it says something like this, I got to I got to kind of lean towards what Linda was saying there. But also in the other sense, too, is that we know that greed leads greed becomes sin. And I think that it, it just has a generally a general thing there. So when you read it here, where are we at on this one right here? So if you have the means given, give a ransom for your sins. It's it's basically saying, listen, um, um, you know, honored the Lord with it. You know, it's like, here's what I mean. Uh, the scriptures say, he who gives a bottle of water to uh, to this to a child or someone who's in thirsty uh, gives unto the Lord, right? So when you give of your finances that you're making and you find creative ways to give those finances to people who are in need, you're giving it as unto the Lord. And I love that passage that Linda used to quote quite a bit when we first got married. Um, but God says, it says, what does it say? It says, uh, when you give to the poor, you lend to the Lord, yeah. right? She used to, Linda used to say that all the time. When you give to the poor, you lend to the Lord and the Lord repays his debts. And, and that, that could be that same connotation where it's coming from there too. Um, it's like understanding that, listen, money can control you. And if money controls you, it can lead to all kinds of sin. And we're not called to worship both God and money. And so this is where I think that you need in this situation here is where somebody who understands the ways of the Lord and is a true discipler can teach younger people by what this means. It's not like you're, you're, you're spending money to get, uh, to take care of your indulgences, to get rid of your sins type of thing. It's more like, listen, you're, you're laying this, you're, you're giving this to the Lord and, and you're giving it as unto the Lord. And so you're doing that. Thomas, you have your hand raised. Well, I, a couple of things. I'm wondering what the original word was that they used. I'm wondering if ransom was a poor translation to it. And, it and then, let me, you know, yeah, let me take a look at, I'm not as good in Greek, so let me see where it's at. Uh, where's that? Ransom four six. Let me see Greek. Yeah, I'm gonna have to look it up, but I can look it up um, because this book actually has the Greek on the on the left. I don't know if you guys can see this, but it actually has yeah. the Greek on the left side and it has the English on the right side. And I don't know Greek like I do Hebrew, but um, I should look at it to see what that is. But yeah, the the word ransom. And it could be just simply something very simple. And that's just how the but translation reads. My what other what point. Oh, I'm sorry. My other point oh, that I ahead. wanted to bring up was the, the ransom, the, the money in your hands going through as a ransom for your sins. Uh, again, I, I wonder what the word ransom is, but I kind of see that as though 
what you do for the least among you, you do for me. And so when you're giving unto the poor and you're giving to those who are in need of it, I, it's a, a way, and I, I don't feel it's a way to atone for your sins because I, I think that's extremely heretical, but um, I, I think that's kind of the point that they're trying to get across. And I think they do it in a really bad, at least the translation we get as Americans are really, it, it, it's not giving it the right light that it should. And I, I the, the light really should be that we should, our goal should be to do unto others as we want done unto us. And, and if we have that little extra money and somebody needs it and we can go by and buy somebody a burger or give them, you know, pay a bill for them or help them with some gas, that's, that's our job. That, that's our instruction. And that, that's what we should be doing. And so I'd be really curious about the word ransom in there. I think, I would think the word sin too. I'll look it up for next week and we can talk about it. I look it up for next week. But I mean, even the word sin right there, sin could mean just simply meaning uh, you missed the mark or an error. It could be a light term of that word sin. Sometimes when we hear the word sin, we we get this engrossed idea, you know, this huge, huge, horrible thing. But sin really means, chata means to miss the mark. Right. So it's like a, a marksman who's shooting a, an arrow and you miss it. You miss that mark. That missing the mark is what sin is. And so anything that that you miss the mark with, you're not hitting the the goal of God's intention with it. And and so it could be something very lightly in the sense of that. But you're right. The word ransom and sin. I'll look into that. But again, this is about the only discrepancy I have so far with what I've read in here. OK, so let's see. Georgie had your hand raised first and then uh, Junior and then Denise. Uh, OK, ahead, George. Yeah, I, I'm thinking of the word ransom uh, and it means they've got you. OK, they got you over a barrel like the kingdom of darkness had us over a barrel. We were trapped, okay? And we were looking for a way out. And, and you know, we were redeemed by Christ. But um, so a ransom, you know, he became the sacrifice Jesus did, Yeshua, the perfect lamb. So I'm thinking... Uh, our, it's talking about the attitude that we're supposed to have, not not that it's going to, you know, our giving isn't going to pay for any of our sins, but it is an attitude when we give, remember where you came from, okay? Like God was, always, you know, reminding Israelites, you came out of bondage, you came out of Egypt for hundreds of years, you were in bondage. Remember the ransom, okay? I think it's more of an attitude uh, when you give. It's not yours. It's what God gave you. It's a blessing, so you share it. What yeah, do you think? and I would say those in, in connect. That's very good, George. I appreciate that. Uh, the attitude behind it. When you see the first part of it, it says if you have the means. So there's the attitude. If you have the means to do it and to help someone and you do it, then you're honoring the Lord. But, you know, the other thing is if you have the means and you withhold it. Um, actually, in the New Covenant, I can't remember where it's at, Colossians, I believe, there's an instruction, an actual command that Paul gives to those that are rich in the community of God to give to the poor. And it's a command. It's, a, it's, a, it's an imperative in the language that basically is saying, um, uh, I command those who are rich to give to the poor because they have the means to do so. And so I think in that sense, it puts on them a sense of a guilt offering type of thing or a guilt sin in a sense of if you have the means. So here's the attitude. And so when you read it again, it's it's chapter four, verse six. Uh, uh, if you have the means, give a ransom for your sins. Basically, if you have the ability to help somebody, don't carry that burden of being found guilty of not helping your brother or your sister, which is a sin. Um, you know, when you're greedy, that's a sin. When you withhold from helping someone, you actually are sinning. So that could be as, as simply as what it means. It could just be something that simple um, and not so heavily in a sense that you're paying a ransom for your sins because we know that um, the, there's only one ransom for our sins, amen? Uh, and that's Yeshua. So go ahead, Junior. Yeah, um... Have you ever, I actually love this movie. Have you ever seen the movie Oosh Pizim? 
Yeah. It reminds me of it so much because he was blessed with a thousand shekels. And then basically he buys like this like citron. And then, then he got put in a trial situation where he like these friends come up from his past. And then he's just like literally being tested all these simple, like all these other ways. And then at the end, you know, you know, the beautiful part, what happens with his uh, wife. But that part just like reminded me of that movie. And if wh whoever hasn't seen it, they should go see it. It's an old movie, though, yeah. but I like it a lot. Last year for Sukkot at the congregation. Oh, look at that. Uh, <laughs> Ushpi Zine is great. I love it. Yeah, uh, yeah. that's really good. excellent. Um, let's see. And then Denise, you had your hand raised. Yes. I, I, I don't, uh, the word ransom doesn't disturb me one way or the other because I think that um, we're so grateful to God for saving us from our sins and the penalty of our sins that he was so gracious that if somebody is in need, just the way we are in, were in need of Yeshua, and God blessed us with him that when someone else is in need, that the same compassion that God had for us, that we would give to someone else. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Linda has something to add and then we'll continue on, but we'll end at chapter four. We won't do five and six tonight because I'm looking at the clock. It's 930. I'm really enjoying this discussion, but uh, we'll continue it on. But I will look up uh some of this especially that verse and i'll look up the greek on it because i think it would be good to understand but I, I think it has something more to do with just like we're all talking about it's like we've been given we've been we've been set free uh from our our damnation and our our livelihood everything we've been set free and pulled out from it so that attitude and i like how george says it, it's an attitude thing uh it's this attitude of saying here i have the ability to help others and that's really what the kingdom of god is all about is to take care of one another and to do that you know and to honor god with that because we're called out of darkness into the kingdom of light linda your hand was raised yeah i wanted to mention about uh on we're gonna read 4. 4.7 we didn't do it yet we didn't do it i don't oh. think we didn't do it let me go to it um linda wants to speak on that one but i don't think we've read that one yet um uh is it hesitate to give and do not complain when giving is it on here um four six two is one two okay where are we at giving money giving money so yeah and then okay do not neglect your responsibilities to your children okay let's let's go to the next one um yeah let's go to the next one um do not be around servants is that right should be it should be the next page do not hesitate to be wait ransom for sins let's see okay go ahead linda um they uh yeah right here do not hesitate to give do not grumble about giving because the one who is good to you you will uh who will your wages and give you your rewards so that's it that's it who will give you your reward um in the this one in your book, it says, do not hesitate to give and do not complain when giving. We know that's a command. For you will find out who is the good payer of wages. Because he, uh, Yeshua said, when you give a child a cup of cold water, you won't lose your reward. So when we give, we're actually storing treasures in heaven. Amen. He's the one who is giving us he is the good pair of wages and he he gives abundantly if he's going to reward us for just giving a child a cup of cold water we've got humongous rewards yeah amen in the store <laughs> i'm excited <Yeah. laughs> amen and says do not neglect your responsibilities to your children begin teaching your children when they are very young and reverently to reverently fear the lord do not um do not boss around your servants while you're angry or in a bad mood, which is true. Never speak to your wife when you're in a bad mood. <laughs> you husbands. Wives, don't speak to your husbands when you're in a bad mood either. Uh oh, that finger came out. You guys can't see it online, but she pointed the finger at me. They hope in the same God, they hope in the same God as you, and your behavior may cause them to lose their reverent fear of God. How powerful is that? God does not care about the masters 
Uh, God does not care about who the masters are and who the slaves are. God does not come to people because of their status. God comes to those whom the Spirit has prepared. That is such a powerful passage. I love that because the scriptures never get away from slavery in the New Covenant. And basically, they're saying there's a, there's a passage that says slaves uh, or uh, masters live with your your you know. Um, he tells slaves, sl slaves, honor your masters and masters don't mistreat your, your slaves. So it, it tells you that. And this kind of really brings a little bit more meat to that bone there. It's really bringing, I love it. I love it. It says here, the hope, they hope. So the slaves or those who were, who were servants in their homes, their hope is this is in the same God as you and their behavior may cause your behavior may cause them to lose their reverent fear of God. That is powerful. That means you, we have a responsibility, right? For those people in that time, they had a responsibility. And it says here, servants, be submissive and treat your masters with respect and fear it is a symbol. It is symbolic of how you would treat God. I mean, that is just straightforward. That is just straightforward with with uh, instruction on what we're called to do. And the new covenant covers that same thing. And then we get here additional instructions. Hate every kind of hypocrisy. Hate everything that is not pleasing to the Lord. Do not abandon the Lord's commandments. Guard what you have received without adding or taking away anything from them. Confess all your transgressions in the, con in the kahal. Do not enter into prayer when your conscience is filled with evil thoughts and desires. And that's true too. We know that if there, you hold anything against your brother or your sister, you go to them and you ask for forgiveness before you come to the altar. And it says, all that is the way of life. How powerful. That's very, very powerful. So we will we will skip out on chapter five, or not skip out, we will do that. We will start that next week's Bible study. But I hope you guys are enjoying this study. Um, right now, there's only one thing that we saw in there, the ransom type of thing with your income. But we all had a good discussion about that and talked about that. And we saw that, hey, it can mean several different things here. And it'd be good to know really the words that they used. Um, um, but I see it in the sense of that when you give give to the poor, you lend to God and God repays his debts. And it's basically we were given not a ransom for our souls to be saved, but we're given a ransom uh, to another per, or, you know, we're kind of like giving unto the Lord and the Lord's going to repay us. And he's the payer of, of, of our wages. Amen. So we walk in the Lord. So I hope you guys are enjoying it. Everybody liking it so far. All right. Excellent. Excellent. And hopefully we can grow from it again. The church got away from this about in the 500, uh, in the fifth century, they moved away from this. So that was between the 400s and 500s AD. They started moving away from the Didache. Uh, many places added and subtracted from the Didache, and they took all that kind of stuff. But it did start off as a very strong thing. Again, they don't know if this entire complete process of the Didache was everything. But to me, it's just, it seems like it seems like the disciples, the apostles were doing exactly what Yeshua said for them to do. And when, when Shaul came and they recognized the huge influx of the non-Jewish people into the body of Messiah, it made sense that the Jerusalem Council, because that was their job, the Jerusalem Council, James the Just, the brother of Yeshua, and Peter, and everybody else that is there, and Thomas, and all those guys that were at the, on the Jerusalem Council, it makes sense that they would say, hey, listen, Paul's going out, and we anoint him as uh, we have sent him out and and anointed him as the apostle to the Gentiles. It's very important that we get an instruction manual together here to help along with this process because the non-Jews are starting to come in. So to me, it makes sense why the Didache even took place and why some people believe it was written around 50 AD, which would make it one of the earliest documents that they had that was distributed to the to the congregations throughout the entire world. So this is, to me, I think this is really good. Now, some people would argue that Paul was basing some of his teachings off of the Didache. I think it was just two different things. I think Shaul was receiving instruction from God, obviously, because he says it. And he was given the right hand of fellowship from the, the Jerusalem council. And as he went out and he taught the ways of the Lord, uh, the non-Jews were able to receive it and do that. But you see here in the Didache, a very practical approach to some very simple truths and giving us insights to that, like one fasting for those who harass you. And then we see here some other things. But so far, I'm enjoying it. I hope you guys are enjoying it. 
and uh, we'll continue on next week. You can download it. Again, go. Uh, if you order the book, again, it's an expensive book, but it's worth uh, getting it for your library. Um, and you can find it on First Fruits of Zion, FFOZ, or you go to the Vine of David. I think the Vine of David, they have, that's their book or their library extension. You can order the book um, and get it. I, again, I don't know how much it was. I bought it uh, a couple of years ago. Um, but I would encourage you guys, if that's what you want to do, go for it. But you can get the Didache online, um, uh, as Jarrett had mentioned. You can get it online, get a PDF of it. You're going to find different translations, just like any Bible. I think it's important to read different translations. We have two of them here, the one I'm showing you, and then the one that's in this book is different. So anyhow, but we will also look at Matthew next week and take a look at some of the passages that highlight what we've been talking about. Okay. So sounds good, everybody. God bless you guys. Thank you so much for tuning in. You guys look like tired now. I see some of you falling asleep. Uh, you're doing really good at keeping those eyes awake, but it's time to go to bed. Amen. <laughs> it's time to continue you. watching. <laughs> but let's let's uh, close in prayer. Uh, Vinu Makenu, Father, our King, thank you for this evening. Thank you for uh, actually getting insight into, uh, into the uh, understanding of the people. Uh, Lord of the first century, speaking to the non-Jewish people. Lord, we thank you for everything that you've established and doing. Uh, that plug the center is going to die. Hold on a second, guys. I don't want to. I don't want this to die in the middle of prayer. Amen. Just plug it back in. So, Father, we just give you glory and praise, and we thank you for this evening, and we look forward to what you have in store for us. And Lord, I just pray that you pour out a beautiful blessing upon everybody that was here tonight. Thank you for their time and uh, being here in, in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. Hands on and I'll take flight to the house of the